Hi everyone and welcome to the first installment of the weekly series Tutorial Tuesdays. My name is Jake and every week I'm going to be bringing you a new Unity tutorial video. Um, so I'll get right into this and show you what I'm going to show you how to make this week. Um, this is one of the fundamental aspects of a lot of different kinds of games and it's just the ability to open and close things like doors, treasure chests, and drawers. Um, so the script we're going to be write, it, writing is the same script that's used to control all three of these so it's highly reusable and I'm using a concept of uh, code once and just reuse over and over again by changing values in the inspector. So anyway this is what it's going to do. We have this drawer that we can open and close. We've got a sound effect that plays. We can see that our little UI reticle changes depending on whether or not there's something we can interact with. There are a couple of objects inside the drawer that you can see move with the drawer to give kind of a realistic effect. All of these drawers can open and close. There's also this treasure chest which opens and closes and this door which opens and closes. And also the script is written in such a way that um, if you have an audio source attached to the game object that the script is attached to, it'll play a sound like the door and the drawers do. And if you don't have an audio source, the script will work still just fine without breaking, and it just won't play a sound. So it's highly customizable and reusable, as I've said. So that's enough for showing you what we're going to be making. Uh, let's go ahead and get started actually making it. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go File, New Project. And I'll just call this doors, drawers, and treasure chests. And um, just a little side note, um, there was a bug that I found and reported to Unity a while ago where if you have a comma in the uh, project path, it'll break when you try to build it, at least to WebGL. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's why I'm not having commas here. So I'll go ahead and create the project with a 3D preset selected. So the first thing I suggest you do is look in the description and uh, download and import all of the assets that are listed there. Um, as far as I know, all of these assets are completely free to use for any game that you want um, with the exception of the hand icon which requires attribution so um, a link to the modified version which I've created is available in the description along with the original source file um, which you'd need to provide attribution to if you do decide to use this in um, your games so let's go ahead and first um, open our browser and I've got these assets already open here. So we just click open in Unity, launch application. If you're doing this from your web browser, you can of course do it from the asset store. It's just a little bit harder to find things in here I find sometimes. I've already downloaded it. So my button says import where yours will probably say download. <clears throat> and after you've downloaded it, that button will change to import just like you see here. I'm just going to take everything from this chest or the, this uh, dresser. So now we see this folder's been brought in. I like to keep all my assets nice and organized as I bring them in, even if there's not a lot to organize because projects grow quickly, and if you get into a certain work mode, then you might forget to organize things. So there's one model. We still have two more to bring in. We've got this treasure chest that you saw. i move this into models as well. And lastly, we have this horror hospital pack, which just has the door that we're going to use. And for this one, I'm actually, you can import everything if you want, but a lot of this is stuff that comes with Unity standard assets. Um, but I'm going to get rid of all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff. And actually, I'm just going to expand this horror hospital pack and find door. And I'm going to just import that. And I'll move that into models as well. Um, the last asset that 
we're going to need from the asset store is iTween, which is a free animation library um, by Pixel Placement. It's a great library. It's going to do all of our heavy lifting and allow us to get the functionality that you've seen in a really a small amount of code. So this will come into this plugins folder. And if we let Unity do its thing and then open this, we'll see this iTween.cs file. And you don't actually need to do anything with this, just as long as it's in your project, you'll be able to access it. And while we're at it, <clears throat> we'll also bring in these assets. Um, I've got two sound effects, one of a creaking door, one of a drawer opening, the hand icon, and the little circle reticle that you saw, as well as a floor texture, just to make things a little easier to look at while we're developing. Bring these all in. And once they load, we'll uh, make some folders to organize those into as well. So we're going to need a audio folder. If we had music in this game, I'd break that up into audio, um, then music and sound effects underneath that folder. Then we're going to have textures. And lastly, we're going to have sprites. And when we bring any sprite in that we're going to be using for a UI element, we're going to want to change its texture type from texture to sprite, 2D and UI. In this case, we can keep all the default settings and just hit apply. So the first thing we're going to do is just set up our scene with the things that we need. Um, I almost forgot that we'll need the uh, characters package, which is a Unity standard package. And we'll just take all of this stuff. And in case you missed how I brought that um, characters asset in, you just click assets, import package, select characters and then it'll load all of that into your project. So the thing that we're going to need from that <coughs> particular packages inside the standard assets folder characters first person controller prefabs and there's this FPS controller that you can drag and drop into pretty much any 3d game uh, to be able to easily navigate your scenes nextly we're going to need to have a thing for our player to stand on because he has this rigid body component attached which will um, cause him to be affected by the physics engine so in this case it's just gonna make him fall can't see that he's falling because we're in uh, the game view mode but let's see just to show you if I change this from maximize on play I'll show you in the scene view you should be able to see him falling so we can see him falling in space so we need something for him to stand on so for now it's just going to be a uh, little cube so we'll go to 3d object create a cube and we'll move it down. We will scale it out both ways here. And it doesn't need to be fancy, just something for him to stand on. Just name it floor. We'll double check that he's not falling through the floor. It looks like he is. Um, if you click these little things, it'll allow you to snap in 90 degree increments and look in a certain direction. And if you click this, it'll put it into orthographic mode, which is really good for seeing if things line up. So we'll just move this floor down a little bit. Or we could have moved the player up just until he no longer this capsule collider no longer clips through the floor he'll actually fall through it um, and so right now you see this warning down here there are two audio listeners in the scene please ensure there's exactly one that's because the FPS controller comes with this camera attached and more importantly this audio listener and if you look up here every time you create a new scene unity automatically puts in a main camera and a directional light at least when you're using 3d um, and it has an audio listener attached so we can delete this main camera because we only need one and uh, then we're ready to move our character around but first we'll go into our textures folder and we'll just drop this on the floor just so we have something that's a little bit easier on the eyes to look at while we create and test our scene so this is set up um, I'm just gonna take a second to save our scene actually you should do this when you first create one just to make sure that it's saved and it's easier to save later now I'm going to put this into a folder called Scenes, and I'll call it um, Doors 
drawers and treasure chests. Now we're ready to actually start getting some things in our scene and, and get into some coding. So we'll go into models, chest of drawers, um, see is there a prefab. So this is the model here, it looks like this is our prefab that they've already made. It's got this animator which we're not going to need but I'm not going to bother taking it off there. Drop that into the scene, looks like it's not in front of our player, so the front of our player is over here. So we'll move this over here. And what I did here is, you can barely see there's a little green square right there, and if you grab that, then it'll only move left and right and forward and back. It won't move up and down on the axis. So depending which square you grab, it locks it to those two axes, making it a lot easier to move things. So then I'll also rotate it. And if you click this rotate tool and you start rotating it, it does a free rotate, but if you hold control and rotate it, it'll snap it in increments. And so you can see over here in the right, that snapped to a clean 90 degrees, so that's an easy way to do that kind of thing if that's what you're going for. Again, I'm going to go into orthographic view and make sure that my chest is sitting on top of the ground. It looks like it is, but it's right inside our players. I'm just going to move it back a little bit, see what that looks like in the game view. That's pretty good, although it looks a little small. So I'm just going to scale this up maybe one and a half times. Now, if we go back into perspective mode and we come in and look at this dresser you can see that we've got a parent object and if we expand it we've got this portion here which is the main body of the dresser as well as a bunch of nicely separated drawers which is what makes this model ideal for what we're about to do um, in order to interact with these drawers however we're going to need to add a component to each of them and that's going to be a mesh collider you could use a box collider but if you do that I'll just show you what will happen here if we pull this out a little bit and we add a box collider this collider actually takes up the whole volume of the drawer so that if you were to put something inside of it anytime you tried to click on one of those things those clicks would be absorbed by the collider on the drawer making anything inside of it inaccessible um, unless you set up some kind of physics layers um, in order to take that into account but we're not going to be doing that and we're not going to be using a box collider rather we're going to use a mesh collider which is a little bit more expensive when it comes to the physics engine but we kind of need it in this case unless you wanted to set up a bunch of box colliders by hand <clears throat> on the uh, chest or, or on the drawer rather one over here one for kind of each wall of the drawer but we don't want to do that we've got this mesh collider set up um, you can't really tell it's there because it matches perfectly with these blue wireframe lines of the mesh if you click convex you can see that it's there what convex does is basically turns it back into that box collider which again isn't what we want but it just lets you see what's there um, so we'll turn that back to concave and we'll actually go back so that's in the closed position now uh, what's nice when you add a mesh collider to any game object that has a mesh filter attached is that it will automatically find the appropriate mesh. So if you look here, we've got this mesh on the mesh filter, we've got the same mesh on the mesh collider, so that the mesh and the collider match up perfectly. And like I said, Unity uh, handles that automatically. Um, so then if we select the rest of these drawers we can add that same component in bulk mesh collider and you see this little line means that each one we have selected is a different one but if we click through we can see that for each one it's found the appropriate mesh to use for the collider next thing we're going to do is write our first script which I'll just call um, interactive object um, I'll make this file available for download in case that's all you're interested in. You just want to use the file to get your game working. You're not all that interested in coding, but I would strongly suggest otherwise because learning coding, if you're serious about game development, is a very important skill. Um, so I suggest you follow along, but if all you want is the script, I'll provide a download link for that as well in the description. So now that we've added this, and all I, all I did there was I typed I did add component and I start typing in the name of the script I want to add. When I first did it, this interactive object thing wasn't here, just this new script was. After I typed in the full name, it just basically you click new script and it'll automatically create a script by that name for you. Now if I double click on this, it will open up my IDE, which is Visual Studio. 
which I highly recommend. It's a lot better than what used to be default with Unity, which was Mono Develop, um, which is an okay tool, but just the IntelliSense that comes with Visual, Visual Studio alone is um, worth switching, not to mention that it has this nice dark theme, and you can actually download this completely for free as well. In fact, I think this IDE is now the default one that comes with Unity when you install. You have an option to download install, I think, um, a Visual Studio tools for Unity. So there's really no reason not to use it anymore. So anytime you create a new script and you open it, you'll wind up with something that looks like this. You've got your start function, which is called um, when this game object first becomes active in your scene. And you've got this update function, which, as this comment says, update is called once per frame. So any code inside here will happen each and every single frame. Um, so to get started with this, we need to think about what it is that our drawer is going to do. It's going to start in some position, and then when we click on it or do some kind of action, we want it to move into an either open or a closed position based on whether it was opened or closed to start. So the first things we're going to need are some vector threes. Um, this is a data type which basically just holds three float values, um, all of which correspond to a coordinate in 3D space, either relating to a rotation, a scale, or a position, typically. And we're going to call this um, open position and close position. And as long as variables are of the same data type, you can declare multiple ones on the same line with a comma. And I think you can even assign a value to each one this way. Although it's going to say that you can't cast a flight, a float to a vector 3, but you can do that. You could say new vector 3 and then pass in your values, but we're not going to do that. And we want this to be private because no other script or class should be able to access these. However, we are using the kind of write code once, reuse the script. Um, methodology so we're going to want to access this from the inspector so in order to keep a field private but still allow it to be accessible from the inspector you can put this serialize field tag before the variable declaration and that'll allow it to show up in the inspector and just to show you what I'm talking about if I get rid of that and I save it and I come into unity and we can look at this interactive object script and after everything is done spinning wheel disappears we can see that we have no exposed variables but if we come back in here and we again do serialize field and then we go back into unity let it do its processing and then look at the script we see that we have these two vector three variables exposed in the inspector that we can assign by hand without having to go back into code which makes it really convenient for designing levels um, so that's what we need to start and I'll show you uh, which function we're going to be calling from the iTween library that I mentioned earlier. It has a ton of functions. Um, the one that we're going to be looking at is uh, to begin with this move to function. So this is iTween's documentation page. The documentation is actually really good for this library. You just select the function that you're using. It'll tell you all the different parameters that you can pass in, all the different um, overloaded uh, methods I guess method calls so the same method different arguments um, and you can look at all these different things to see what they do whether or not you want to use them um, we're going to be using some fairly basic ones to get this working but I think it's a nice effect so uh, like I said we're going to be using iTween um, and we're going to be using move to so in order to access that all you have to say is iTween dot move to and here's where um, Visual Studio is really nice. You open your bracket and right away it tells you what parameters this thing will take. So to begin with it takes a game object which is the target object that we're going to want to move. In this case it's the game object that this script is attached to. So we could say this that game object. However we don't even need the this. So we can say game object for our first one. The next one is going to be the position to move it to. So for now, we'll say that we want to move it to the open position, which is a vector 3 here, you can see, which corresponds to this data type. And lastly, we're going to need a time that we want the animation to take. We don't currently have a variable for that, but we'll make one. 
I know I'm going to call it animation time, so I can stick it in there. The IDE will bark at me with that red underline, um, but once I make it, everything will be happy here. Serialize field again, because it's going to be private. We don't want any other classes to see it. This time the data type is going to be a float, so that's basically just a decimal number, and we're going to call it animation time, as we did below. Now that we've done that, we see all the red lines go away, everything's happy, and... The only other thing we need to do now, just for testing to make sure this function call is working as we expect it to, is to say um, we'll have some triggering action, which will be, say, we'll hit the E key, which is a common interaction button in video games. So we'll say if input dot get key down, and we can say key code dot E, then do this itween dot move to thing. And so all this is, says is if the user presses the E button, then do this. Um, and it'll check for this every frame since that's in the update method. In order to make this work, we need to go into the uh, game object here and we're going to want to set an open position and a closed position once everything loads. Also we'll need an animation time. I know that I'm going to want this to probably be 1.5 seconds. The closed position, what we're going to want to do for that is just to look at the position it's currently in right here, which are these values, and we can copy and paste those values here just to make sure that they're accurate. You could probably get away with rounding them a little bit, but we might as well just copy and paste. We're also going to need an open position. So right now I'm going to copy this component, and you'll see why in a second, because I'm going to move it, and I want to move it back to the exact same place without any guessing. So I'll move it out, and actually that's what I just did isn't going to work, so I'll have to do something else. So I'll move it out, and then I'll... Uh, copy these values here. That's why it's not going to work. It's because I had to recopy these. So this is the position of the drawer when it's open. We paste these into the open position vector 3. Now I'm going to have to control Z back to get this back to where it was, but if I do that I'm also going to lose the values that I've put inside this um, script here. So if I right click this, say copy component, that'll copy all the values that this component has and I can control Z back until it's where I want it to be. You can see these values have also reset, but I can right click here and say paste component values. That's a little trick that saves a lot of time. If it's something you're not familiar with, that looks like it says zero, but if I click out it shows up as expected. So now we should be okay to hit play and we should have iTween now animating our object whenever we press the E key. Move over here and that does not look right at all. So um, I knew this was going to happen, I just kind of wanted to show um, the importance of knowing how methods work, reading documentation and finding out how to solve problems. So if we look at the transform of this object. It looks like nothing like what we've passed down here for the open position. 2.308 isn't even close to 0 0.421 and neither are the other values. So what's happening here is that by default the move to function moves the game object in world space. So if we take this out of the hierarchy of this chest of drawers game object we'll see the position over here change quite drastically because it'll be represented in um, world space rather than local space. So we click, the, drag that out, now we can see that these values more or less correspond to the values that we've placed in here. And so that's what's happening. So what we need to do is we can just click play and it'll undo all the changes that we've made here, move it back into the hierarchy. Rather than have it animate in world space, we need to find a way to tell move to to animate in local space, and that's where documentation comes in handy. So right now we're using this function call, which takes a game object, a vector 3, which is the position to animate to, and the amount of time we want that to occur. But if we look at the documentation, there's no there's no function call to pass in um, whether it's world or local space, at least not at first glance. But if we look here, we see that it takes a game object, which is the target, which we already have, and then it also takes this hash table args. Um, and you can look elsewhere in the documentation to find an explanation of what exactly this is, or you could just Google iTween hash table example, but I'll explain it here. Basically, you're going to create a hash table, which is basically just an array where rather than having a number for the index in the array you could have any kind of data type uh, pretty much so you could have a number as is the usual case in a um, 
typical array or you could have a string or um, anything along those lines and in in this case this hash table takes strings as keys and those keys will each have values so these are all your keys that you can pass into this hash table and so we're gonna need the position we're gonna need the time so we can find position here as well as time and there's also this is local parameter which is um, what specifies whether to animate in local or world space so it says right here to animate in world space or relative to the parent it says false is the default so is local equals false by default meaning that it should animate in world space which is exactly what we're seeing so we need to override that and in order to do that we need to bring in this um, data type that might be a little bit new to some people who are beginners and it might sound kind of scary but it's really not so we're gonna make this private it's gonna be a hash table we're not going to need to assign to this in the inspector, so we don't need the serialize field attribute, and we'll just call it itweenargs, because that's what it is. And on start, we'll set itweenargs to a new, actually we'll set it to itween.hash, which is also this itween function that um, will return a hash table in the correct format for iTween. And so still it might be a little confusing. Now I'm going to start showing you how to add to this hash table. There's a different way to do it. You can pass in all your all your keys and values right inside this instruct uh, constructor, but it's a little confusing. It's less maintainable. Uh, you wind up with a big long string on one line that's just gross to look at. And so I prefer to do it this way. You can say itweenargs.add and then you can pass it a key and a value as we see here. So if we look back at the documentation, one of the keys is position. So we'll go ahead and use that. And it's just a string. And then we give it the value. And the value is going to be open position to start. Now we're going to want to do this again, itweenargs.add, but this time we saw before there was a time argument. So we'll give it that, and then we'll give it the animation time. Uh, float that we have up here. There's also a is local parameter, which is the whole reason that we're doing this. So itweenargs.add, and it was called is local, and we'll pass it in uh, true. We don't need to have a variable for that because we'll just assume that we'll always want to animate in local space. Um, if for some reason you don't want to do that, you can just change this to false and it will animate back in world space actually it's probably better just to omit this line if that's the case and I think that's probably all we need um, so the way this works is it'll call this function or when you call this we're now we're gonna get rid of this and we're gonna look at this here at this hash table args argument that we're gonna pass in so we, we have a hash table here it's called itween args it's filled with all of these values that we've passed it so when we call this, iTween is going to look at this and it's going to see, it's going to access these by key. So it'll say um, something like args position in order to access this open position value. And if it finds something, then it will use that in the animation that it does. Um, so now, if we try this again, we should see that it animates as expected just by moving out of the drawer a little bit. There we go. So right now it just opens. I'm hitting E over and over and over again. Nothing's happening. That's because it's always set to do this open position animation. So what we're going to need now is also a boolean, which is just a true or false value, which will let us determine whether or not the drawer is in an open or a closed state. So we'll call it is open. By default it'll be false. I need to give the data type here which is bool, short for boolean. And so by default it's false. However we can still set this in the inspector as we'll see later. And what we're going to want to do is every time we hit E we'll do this and then we'll say is open equals not is open. So what this does anytime you see this with booleans is it takes whatever value is currently in the boolean and replaces it with the opposite value so if it's true it'll replace it with false if it's false it will replace it with true this exclamation mark also known as a bang just means not so is open equals not is open so it's the opposite 
So now, each time we hit E and this animates, we'll flip the state of is open. But there's more to it than that. Um, if it is open, we're going to want to change the position to the closed position. So what we're actually going to do is want to move this down here. We'll say, up here we'll say, if is open, then um, I tween args, and this is how we access the parameters that we've already done. We don't want to do add again because it already has this and it would add a new one, but we want to access this position value. And if it is open, we want it to then take the closed position value. Otherwise, else, we'll want to give it the open position again. Then we want to flip it, and then we want to perform the animation. So now if we hit play, if I press E, as many times as I want, we'll see it opening and closing. It can happen in the middle of the animation if we want. You could add some extra code to, to only allow the player to do it after the animation is fully played if you like. We're not going to cover that in this tutorial. I think this is a pretty nice effect. It's responsive. The user doesn't have to wait. and I think that's probably the best way to handle it. Um, however, this is happening now whenever we press E, which is going to be a problem, especially if we go here to drawer 2 and we add an interactive object and we go through this process again where we set the close position and then we set the open position something like this and then just for fun I'm just gonna say this one is open to start We'll set its animation time also to 1.5f or 1.5. So if we save our scene just because it's a good thing to do every once in a while and we hit play, when I hit E, one drawer will open, the other will close, and they're both happening at the same time. If I added that script to each of these drawers, it all open or close at the same time, regardless of how close or far you are from those drawers, which really doesn't make sense and isn't the functionality we want. However, we know that our calls to iTween are working, so that's kind of the reason we did it this way. Uh, what we're now going to want to do is move our input control into a new class that will be attached to the player. Um, I suppose it doesn't need to be attached to the player, it just makes it easier to access things that are attached to it. So we're going to take this, um, all this input.getKeyDown code, looks like I missed a thing here, and then we're going to go back into Unity, and actually I didn't just delete that, I copied it to my um, clipboard so I can use it later. I'm going to move this into scripts, which I don't have yet. move this into scripts. We're going to select our FPS controller. It already has some scripts on here that Unity gave us. We don't want to mess with those. They work just fine as they are, but we're going to add a new script called Interactor. And we'll move this right into scripts. If Unity will let me, then we'll open that in Visual Studio again. I hate these comments, so I always delete them. And now here we're going to do our if input dot get key code dot e. And what we're going to want to do here is start getting into Unity's physics engine a little bit. Um, this is kind of a basic part of it, but uh, it's important. It's very useful. It's um, so we'll say physics. So we're accessing the physics class, and we'll say uh, dot raycast and basically a raycast. Um, you can think of it as shooting a bullet from a start location in a given direction um, at an infinitely fast speed. If it hits anything in that line, you can get information about what it is that it hit. Um, and that's perfect for our case. So we're going to shoot this imaginary ray or bullet out from the position of the camera if it hits one of our drawers, then we'll look for the interactive object 
component and then we'll call a method inside that which we have yet to write so we can look through all the different um, versions of this function call for one that we want and so some of these look promising this one's good we need a start position we need a direction and we need this um, raycast hit info object although we also need to specify distance so that our player has to be within a certain range of the object before it can interact um, and luckily there's this guy right here which has exactly everything that we need it needs an origin a direction this hit info object that we're going to get information about the hit from and the max distance that the ray will travel so the origin is going to be at the camera's position so you can access the main camera by going camera.main.transform.position. Now this is a little bit gross and we're going to be using it twice because we're going to say camera.main.transform.forward so it's straight ahead from the camera is what we're going to be using. And this is a lot of code here. It's already making this function call long. Um, and there are slight performance implications every time you say camera.main. It's like calling game object up find. It's not super intensive, but um, if we're going to be using it more than once, as we are here, it's better to store a reference and then access the reference because that's faster. Um, so what we're going to want to do here, and, and also uh, as a side note, camera.main will only work if you have a camera which is tagged as main camera in your scene. So if we expand this and look at first person controller, there's a camera here, and this game object is tagged as main camera. So if you find that camera.main isn't working for you, check that your camera is tagged as main camera because it has to be. Um, so up here, we'll create a private camera cam, we'll call it, and we'll say cam equals camera.main, and that will return our uh, game object. Our, our camera game object. So now rather than saying camera.main dot blah 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 we can just say cam dot transform position and cam dot transform dot forward. Next thing we have is this ray cast hit um, out object that we need. So uh, you need this out keyword which tells this method that it's going to be modifying um, the object that we pass it. We're just going to call it hit and it's going to yell about this because it doesn't know what that is yet. So up here we'll make a private and if we look at the the name of or the type of that object that it's looking for we have this ray cast hit object. And we're just going to call it hit. So we're going to have this private raycast hit object, which we're going to pass in here. And again, that keyword is out and hit. And then the last thing we're going to need is the max distance. So we'll just say um, interact range. And we'll create that as a float. And we'll make that um, accessible using the serialize field tag so we can customize that in our script if we need to. So serialize field, private, float, interact range so we're gonna raycast but then what um, we're going to say uh, so once this is called any hit will be stored in this hit object so we can say if hit dot transform so this will return um, a transform which will be converted by to a boolean in an if statement if it hits anything any game object pretty much because any game object has a transform so if it hits something then we're going to want to see if there's an interactive object component there um, so we're also going to need a reference to that this is going to be private as well we're not going to need access to it in the inspector so we'll just say private interactive object we'll just call it interactive object you could pick something smaller like obj or something like that um, but I like to have long names it makes the code easier to read um, so then if hit dot transform so if it hits something then we'll say interactive object equals uh, hit dot transform dot get component and then we give it a type here um, this is called a generic uh, type here so it takes different types you can look into that more if you want um, but so we're going to get uh, a component of type interactive object 
So if the game object that is hit has an interactive object component, then this variable will now have a reference to that object. Otherwise, it's going to have a value of null stored in here, um, which is actually going to help us uh, based on the way that we're going to write this. You need to be careful with null values sometimes because if you try to access um, something using a null value or a null reference, then your game's just going to break completely. Um, so you need to be be careful, but in our case, it's going to be fine. So then we'll say um, interactive object will have this, and then in our inside of our button press here, um, we could do that inside here, but rather we'll say um, interactive object dot perform action, which is a method that we're about to write. Actually, we've written the context tense; we just haven't moved it. So we'll say uh, public, so that will allow our other script to access it. We'll say void because it's not returning anything, and then we'll say perform action. And it doesn't take any parameters, so this is empty. And we can take all of this, cut it out of the update function, paste it here, delete that, and now we've got this function that we can call. So now if we come over here, let's see here, it's not liking this saying that it doesn't contain a definition for perform action. It definitely does. So it's not saving. Maybe I've got a typo here. Let's see. Dot perform. No, it's not finding it. So probably all I'll need to do, sometimes it'll do this. I'm just going to close these scripts and open them again. I don't know why I've got three, three copies of this here. It doesn't make any sense. But now that hmm, this isn't working still. Private interactive object, interactive object, interactive object. Oh, because I didn't. This should be perform action. That didn't save somehow. Let's see if there's a way to close these. Remove. Mm, I don't want to do that in case it breaks anything. I don't know why. I've got three copies there. It's kind of annoying. This still isn't working. Okay. I'm going to do this, even though it might be a bad idea. I've only got two now. I'm going to delete this one as well. Okay, now I've got two. I've got interactive object.cs with perform action. Interactive object.cs. iTween is not working anymore. Although plugins is there. Okay, I'm just going to close this and this. I'm going to close this. Sure. Sure. Come back into Unity. Hopefully my scripts are still there. The namespace global already contains interactive object. So this is, I don't know what happened. Hopefully you don't encounter something like that. Interactive object got perform action. Interactive object got perform action. Everything looks good here. If we go back into Unity, is there anything complaining? Let's see if we clear this. Still complaining about this. Interactive object of perform action. Just just says void. We need to say public void so that the other one can access it. It was saying it's inaccessible due to its protection level. That's now gone. Alright. So we'll come in here and now this should only work when we uh, are looking at an object and press E. So we've got a null reference exception here which is one of the things I talked about. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a second to set up that reticle because it makes it easier to tell where our rays are going to be sh uh, cast to. Um, so this is kind of a quick tutorial on how to set up a crosshair or something super quick in a game. So we'll go UI and we'll create image. That'll create a canvas and an event system. You don't really need to worry about those right now. But I'm going to create this, we call it reticle. Then I'm going to select a sprite. I'm going to use the reticle icon that we brought in. And if we look here, we can see that it's huge. We can set native size, and that'll set it to the same um, pixel size that um, the actual image is at. You can't really see it there, but it's there. If I go into scene view and press F, it'll find it, and you can see it there. Um, anyhow, now this is going to be in the middle of our screen, and it's there. And if we walk up, we can see we've got this null reference exception. So let's see what's going on with our code. 
this is not uh, set to anything. So we can say if interactive object then we'll call that. So we'll check if that's null. If it's not, then it'll perform the action. So let's have a look here and see what's happening. Just going to move this out of the way. So nothing is happening. Why is that? If we get centered on a drawer which has an interactive object here ah you know what it is because we haven't set the um, interact range of our interactor script it's set to zero so that's as far as the ray will shoot so it'll never hit anything so um, I believe unities units are in meters so we'll say something like two meters now let's try this again Look at that. Kind of works sometimes. But for some reason, it's only working on the first one. Oh, now it's working. Is this other one working again? They're both working. So there's something funny going on. And what I suspect is well, I won't tell you. Let's actually find out ourselves. If hit.transform, then we'll debug.log um, hit.transform.name for some reason I'm not getting my code hints here so something funny has happened with the editor but that's fine um, so now what that's going to do is every time we hit some object we're gonna write its name to the log so that we can see what it is that we're hitting and why these aren't working and I think so if I hit that drawer log we see drawer 2 showing up in the log drawer 1 if I get close and I look down what am I getting now oh FPS controller so what's happening is as we look down we are hitting this capsule collider on our player now there's a number of ways to handle this um, you could shrink the collider although that's going to affect how your player moves through space how small of spaces he can fit in and things like that rather what I would recommend is using the um, layers uh, which unity has built in to set this to ignore raycast um, a quick note here if you're using these scripts for a first-person shooter and you rely on enemies raycasting at your player um, while shooting him then you're not going to want to do this you're going to want to set up a custom layer to put your player on and you're going to want to look at iTween's documentation for or sorry not iTween you're going to want to look at the uh, physics.raycast documentation and see if you can implement a function call which has of course my code hints aren't showing up but there's a, a layer mask parameter that you can pass in um, and so research that a little bit if you're using this for a first person shooter to try to figure it out and if at any point there's anything in any of these tutorials that you see that doesn't make any sense to you or is just slightly confusing or you don't understand how it works any questions at all post a comment below I do read all of them and I will respond and if you need help I'll do that too um, so anyway I've set that layer to ignore raycast so it will no longer get hit by any rays that we cast and we should be able to stand as close as we want to these drawers without having that happen anymore so now it's behaving a little bit more than uh, as we expected that's a little ugly we're not going to handle that right now um, anyhow we've got our drawers working there's one more thing that we have to do however and that's make them play a sound so what we're going to do is select our drawer we're going to add and audio source that's not what we want to do we want to add an audio source and we're going to give it an audio clip um, let's see here wood creek glass slide is the one that we want we're gonna want it to not play on awake we're gonna only want it to play when we tell it to play and what we're going to do is uh, write this in such a way that you don't need to put an audio source on every one. You only put it an audio source on the ones that you actually want to play a sound and make sure that you give it an audio clip. So what we're going to want to do in our interactive object is create a private audio source. I'll just call it a source. 
Um, then in perform action, we'll want to say, um, actually, sorry, rather in start, we're going to want to set that audio source equal to get component audio source. And again, it'll look for it and assign that here if it finds one. Otherwise, this will contain a null value, which is the same as false when used in if statements. So down here, we can say if a source, a source dot play. And that'll automatically take whatever audio clip you've given it and play it. So if we go back into Unity now, and on this one drawer that we've given this audio clip to, that will play a sound while the other won't, and it will do so without breaking if all goes well. So if we hit E, there we've got that drawer sound. It's not the best sound in the world. It would need to be edited because it's got a lot of white noise there. And then this one has no audio source. It doesn't simply doesn't play a sound, but it doesn't break. So that's good. Also a note, I've still got this debug statement in here somewhere. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, if you do a lot of debug statements in a short amount of time, it'll actually kill your frame rate like crazy. I've encountered bugs where I was like, why is my frame rate dropping? I can't figure it out. And only to discover that debug.log is the culprit. You wouldn't expect it to do that, but it does. So we've got our drawers completely set up. There's one more thing that we'll do so that we don't have to come back to this dresser. If Unity will let me move and that's to add some objects inside the drawer. There's a number of ways to do this. You could child the objects to the drawer, but then you might wind up getting some problems where the way colliders work in Unity, although this might be restricted to objects that have rigid bodies attached, is that any, I think that's the case, if you have an object with a rigid body attached, which we'll look at in a second, it's basically what allows Unity's physics engine to take control of that object. If that object has a rigid body attached and you put um, game objects as children of that game object in the same way that this is a child of that, then all of those com colliders will be combined and any time a collision is detected on a child, it will be considered to be a collision with the parent, which typically isn't what you want when you're trying to grab an object out of the drawer. Although, like I said, I think that's only an issue if you're using rigid bodies on the drawer. The way that we're going to be doing this is not to child the objects to the drawer. Rather, it's to place them inside the drawer, give them a rigid body of their own so that they can kind of move, as you saw in the demo at the start of this tutorial, just like real objects do. I think that's the best effect. And um, it also removes the need from having to make those children of the drawer. So we're going to create a 3D object. First we'll create a sphere. We're going to shrink that down significantly to about the size of a tennis ball or something. We'll move it up. We'll move it towards us. Move it up a little bit more. And then we've got a sphere collider which is great. We're now going to need to add a rigid body. And that's, like I said, basically anytime you add a rigid body to an object, it's going to allow Unity's physics engine to take control of that object unless you specify that it is kinematic, which means you're only going to move it through code explicitly. Unity's physics engine won't touch it. This is not going to be kinematic. We want physics to interact with it. So let's just see how putting this in the drawer works as is. If we close the drawer, what happens? that's not what we want. So the reason that's happening actually is because we don't have a rigid body on our drawer. So if we add a rigid body to this, we just leave it as is. We hit play. Now we shouldn't be seeing, oh see now the drawer fell right through the floor. And what we're going to need to do, we see this error here which actually gives us a hint. Um, luckily we want our drawer to be kinematic. So, we go to our rigid body, we say is kinematic, meaning that Unity's physics engine won't take control of it. It's only going to be moved when we move it through code, which we are through iTween. Um, then, it should now not be affected by gravity as it was before, even though use gravity is checked. Um, and if we go over and hit E to it now, see it won't fall through the floor as it did. We hit E, that ball now moves nicely with the drawer. 
and you can add extra things in there, cubes and stuff if you feel like, but this tutorial is already starting to run over time, and we have two more objects to write. Um, so let's get right into that. Um, we're going to close our chest of drawers, finish with that for now. We're going to bring in our treasure chest. We'll go to our prefabs, bring that out. There it is, it is gigantic. We'll cut that maybe in half. We'll move that over here. We'll again use our little rotate trick where we hold control to get it to that nice 90 position. Go to orthographic mode again, move it down until it touches the floor. There we go. Go back into perspective mode, have a look at it. That looks like it's about the right size. Move it back. There we go. Now this model as well is separated into two nice sub meshes, one which is a lid, which is what we're going to use to open. We can get away with a box collider on this because nothing is going to be inside the lid, presumably. We're also going to want to add the interactive object script. Let's keep everything pretty much the same as we did before. We're not going to change any code yet, just so we can see how this is happening. Set the animation time to one and a half. Set the closed position to, what is it here? We're actually going to be looking at rotating this. So rather than moving it, like that as we did with the drawer, we're going to rotate it. So if we select our rotate tool, and we look here. Where is it rotating? It's rotating on the Z. Open is about, depending how far you want to go, something like 150. So we'll set the close position to 0, 0, 0 as it is here. We'll set the open position to 0, 0, 150. And animation time to 1.5. Now what's going to happen here now, as you probably have guessed, let's have a look, is it's not going to open like a treasure chest. It's going to slide to some weird position somewhere off in space at position 150. So that's not what we want at all. Um, rather we want it to rotate. So how do we do that? Um, it's probably not using what we've already done here which is itween.move to as that implies movement. Rather it's going to be a different itween call which is itween. Let's have a look. Of course, it's not showing up anymore. It's itween dot rotate to, and it's going to take also. You have to trust me on this since my code hints aren't working. It's going to take a game object. It's also going to take that itween args. However, we're going to need a way to tell the game object whether we want it to rotate or slide. Um, so what we're going to want to do is create a private enum. We'll call it, um, let's see, movement type. And this should actually be capitalized. It doesn't really matter. It's just prettier that way. Movement type. And then we open some braces here and we'll say slide and uh, rotate. So uh, basically, an enum is just a list of limited values that you define. So it can either be slide or it can be rotate. It can be nothing else. We're also going to need a, another private instance of that enum um, and we're going to call it movement type. So here we define the enum. Here we create an instance of it. And this is private but we're going to want access to it in the inspector again. So we'll serialize the field We'll move this up with all of our other serialized fields just to keep things nice and neat. Bring things together here. And then what we're going to want to do is add a little bit of checking in here for whether it's a slide or a rotate. So we know that this is our slide. However, we don't want to have to rewrite all of this for our rotate. So what's going to be different? Luckily, we can assign both. If we look at the iTween documentation again for rotate to, it doesn't take a position, rather it takes a rotation. So since rotate to has no idea of this position key, um, we can still pass that in and it just won't look for it. So it's not going to do anything. But we, what we can also do is take this here and pass in the rotation. 
because move to has no position, no idea about rotation, and rotate to has no idea about position. So we can pass both of them in. Since neither of those methods are looking for the other one, we can safely do this without breaking anything. So we're going to say here itween dot rotation again equals in this time open position. Now what we're going to want to do is say here if um, movement type equals movement type dot slide we're going to want to move the object because a slide implies movement um, otherwise we can do uh, the rotate actually rather than do an if statement here I'm going to use a switch so it's a little more easy to expand on if you decide to have different types of movement I'm not sure what other types you might want to have but you might want to expand on this so we'll say switch um, movement type and we'll say case um, movement type dot slide then a colon to say this is what's happening if that's the case you always need a break to make sure that it doesn't do the following cases and then you'll say case movement type dot um, rotate colon again break again and then we'll move this move to call inside the slide case and then we'll move this rotate call into the rotate case. Clean up some of our white space here. Make sure our code is still pretty. There should be comments in all of this, um, but there isn't. Um, hopefully, maybe in the one that I upload, there will be comments, um, but for the time being, there's not. So now, all we have left to do is go back to our interactive objects, define whether we want them to slide or rotate, and by magic, everything should just work. Uh, so now we see this is going and we have this new movement type and this is why I use an enum because it limits the selections you can make in the inspector makes it super easy super nice you can't accidentally pass it a wrong string or something if that's what you're checking you always have to pick one of the two values there so by default it slides so we don't need to change our drawers however we set rotate so now this is going to rotate on the pivot point of the treasure chest which it's hard to tell right here whoops if you look at the lid here and you look at the pivot point it's set to the very back so if you're using some custom object and it's rotating in the middle then you can create a parent object align that object to wherever the hinge should be and then put this as a child of that and then it should rotate on that pivot point. Um, anyhow, let's test this out, see if our rotation is now working. See it's going the wrong way. So let's try setting this to, was it negative 150? It was, that's what it should be, negative 150. And have another look. There you go. Treasure chest is opening and closing. Our drawers should still be working, and they are. And the last thing to do, um, just to show you that this is a versatile script, that we no longer have to go into this code whatsoever in order to um, use it on further objects, unless you want to actually modify some of the um, or add functionality to it. Uh, we're going to bring in our door models door let's see door where are you door okay so this unfortunately seems to have been broken so we'll put that goes into the albedo because of the texture this purple looking thing is a normal map which just makes it look bumpy and so you can see those bumps out of there this door is huge so we'll set this to a scale let's see these are all kind of funny values so I don't want to set those manually we want to uniformly scale it until it looks about right probably something like that we'll move it let's see here go back to orthographic view move it next to these things stay in orthographic and move it to the floor and then there's a handle on one side of this door which is what I want to see just because I'm I guess being a stickler so we'll move that this way holding control actually move it this way using control so it's at 180 we will move it over 
then we will add a box glider because it's a boxy shape so it doesn't really matter. We'll also add an interactive object. We will then, where did this go? Set our closed position or closed rotation so Y of 180 is the closed position and then the open position let's see something like that it's going to be we'll just call it 290 open position 290 on the Y and if we add an audio source without having to go into our script again it will just automatically look for this audio source We'll set the audio clip to the wood creek, even though it's a metal door. Come over, and it should work. Ah, see what I didn't do there? See how that played right away? I didn't set the play on awake to false on the audio source. So now, if we walk over to our door, hit E. Let's see what happened there. Can you guess? Take a second to think about it first. The door just seemed to disappear. Did we see something like that happen before? If you guessed right, bonus points, we didn't change our movement type to rotate. So now, everything should work just fine. Why is it doing that? It's kind of a neat effect depending on the style of your game, if you're going for maybe a retro style. Again, we didn't set the animation type. nicely and we can change the animation time to say five seconds if we want maybe a more suspenseful door open ah because at start is where we define the animation time if we look at our code that happens in the start function set the animation time so any changes we make during runtime aren't going to be kept so we'll set it to five now it should open nice and slowly we've got a nice reusable script that we can put on a bunch of different types of game objects. You could put this on a window, a treasure chest, a door, a patio door, a trap door, you know, sci-fi kind of opening sideways doors, whatever you like. Super reusable. There's one thing that we didn't do, and it's actually fairly super quick, because we already have most of the stuff set up, and that's our little UI interactor thing. So we already have this image. What's important about this is that when we first created it, it creates it in the very middle of our canvas, which is important because that's where our rays are being shot from, is from the middle of the camera. At least that's the case um, for our first person game. Um, so we don't want to move that or it's going to no longer match up with where our rays are going. So we can duplicate this object by pressing Control D, not J. That's a Photoshop shortcut, which I tried. Um, and we're going to change this to um, Interact. Uh, icon and rather we'll call this default icon to better differentiate them and this interact icon we're going to change to the hand we're going to set native size again so we just saw that grow over here and so it's not obstructing our view I'm going to set this to something like 175 I might as well do that for this fella is too so I'm just changing the alpha channel which makes it slightly transparent and we're going to want to leave both of these active for now because we're going to actually be um, disabling one through code. We're going to assign this to the canvas, which is something that probably makes sense. Although, you know what, it really doesn't matter where you put this. Let's just I guess we'll keep it on the canvas. We'll go in here, we'll add a component, we'll call it, um, let's see, reticle controller. And we'll open this up. What we're going to need to know is both of these image uh, game objects that we made. Rather, we don't even need the image, we just need to know them as game objects. We'll say private game object equals oh and we'll just call it um, default icon and interact icon then we'll find them both we'll say um, default icon equals game object dot find uh, and the name was default icon if I remember correctly 
Um, if you don't like doing this, you could do the serialized field thing here again, or just set that to public and assign these directly in the inspector by dragging them in. Um, however, I like doing things this way typically. Um, and I'll say interact icon equals game object dot find interact icon. It'll have both of those, and then on start, we'll want to disable the interact icon so that only the default one is shown. Interact icon dot set active false. That's going to disable the game object. Then we will get rid of the update. We don't need that. However, we do need a public void show icon. We'll pass in a boolean which will say is interact icon. So when we call this we'll pass in a boolean and we'll say um, whether or not we want to show the interact icon or the default icon. Um, this will really only work um, in this format if you've only got two icons. You can look at uh, adding to this or changing it if you've got more but I'm not going to be covering that here. Um, so what we're going to do is say if is interact icon so we'll say this um, default icon dot set active not is interact icon because if it is the interact icon then we do not want to show the default icon so if this is true we want this to be false and on the other hand if it is true then we do want to show the interact icon this class is done super small um, what we're going to want to do is go into the interactor we're going to want to give it an instance of the reticle controller and we'll say, we'll say private reticle controller reticle controller in start we'll say reticle controller equals game object dot this is a slightly slightly different one a find object of type it will look through all the game objects the first one it finds of this type it will take um, and it's going to be of type reticle controller don't know why it's doing this to me tonight and now we've got a reference in our update will now want to do this every frame we'll want to do our raycast every single frame because we want to update our UI every single frame to make sure it doesn't only happen when we press E so every frame will do a raycast if it hits something we'll assign interactive object then we can say um, you can do it just in here I suppose um, you know what? We don't want to do it in here. We want to do it whether or not it's hit something. We want to say reticle controller dot show icon, I think was the function it was, show icon. And this is going to look a little strange because we're not passing it a boolean. We're passing it an interactive object. However, when you pass that into a location that's expecting a boolean, um, it will return true if there is an object stored there, and it will return false if there is not an object stored there. So, now that should work. Let's go back into Unity, see if everything's working. So, so far so good that hand icon, even though it was active, is now disappeared. We walk a little closer, oh look, and that turns into a hand. However, see it's not disappearing. Why is that? And if we press E, look, here's a bug that we didn't notice before. That's still moving even though we're not touching it, we're not even looking at it. So let's have a look. Interactor. If hit.transform. So it's only going to assign this if it's hit something. So if our raycast is hitting nothing, just air, then it'll keep the last reference that it saw. So what we're going to want to do here is say else um, interactive object equals null. So that'll get rid of a reference if we're not hitting um, an interactive object. 
So now this should all be working perfectly. There should be no bugs. We walk up, we press E, nothing happens. We walk up, we get our hand icon. If we go over the ball, our hand icon disappears because we're no longer interacting with the drawer and there's nothing attached to that ball. So we're not hitting that drawer, we're hitting the ball now. But as we do this, we can see that that's working. It's working fine. We move back and that disappears. We move to our chest and that works. We move to our door and that hand works. So there you go. You've got the startings of an adventure game or a shooter or a survival horror game. You can now open drawers, investigate things, open doors, and it's all for free. If you like this tutorial, you found it helpful, please subscribe to the channel. Check out the links to my Facebook page for Fidelum Games, my game development company. Check out the link to the trailer of my upcoming game, Pixel Zombie Shooter. Um, check out my developer journal on gamedev.net. And like I said, if you've had any questions, any troubles, I do read the comments, I do respond to them. Um, I will help you if you're stuck. 